Um, I'm going to start off today, as I mentioned before, we're going to you know, be focusing on the suttas and during this retreat. And, and uh, I want to focus on the suttas. I always want to establish, first of all, why the suttas really matter, why they are so important. Uh, because once you have some idea why the suttas really are important, it's actually much easier to get excited about them, yeah, get keen on reading the suttas and understanding what the Buddha actually was teaching. And, yeah, you can read really this. And, and this is one of the great uh, uh, you know, advantages of having that background to know why we should be looking at this. So, so uh, that's where I want to start out. But the general idea of the retreat is to, uh, the theme of the retreat, as I have called it, is a, a why, to reflect wisely how to think about uh, the Buddhist teachings. Uh, so that they actually become much more powerful in your life. Uh, uh, as you uh, all know, yeah, we, what we have, sure, I hope you, maybe some of you don't know, I don't know if there are any real beginners here, uh, but uh, the, uh, in the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, yeah, the main exposition of the Buddha on how to practice these teachings, uh, it always begins with uh, uh, right view. Yeah, that's how the Noble Eightfold Path begins. Uh, and because it begins with right view, uh, uh, it means that the idea of thinking about the world in the right way is actually so important. You think about the world in the wrong way, you think about yourself in the, in the wrong way, then uh, you're undermining the very foundation of the Buddhist path. The very beginning point uh, becomes problematic. Yeah. So it matters enormously that we think about things in the right way, that we reflect wisely. It, it is important, yeah, it kind of makes sense. <laughs> Of course, wise reflection is going to be important. It's kind of bleeding obvious when you think about it. Uh, but uh, it actually, sometimes I think we underestimate how powerful it is. Uh, thinking about the path, reflecting on the path, contemplating the factors, uh, understanding things according to reality, seeing the world uh, a little bit like the Buddha saw the world. If we can see the world the way the Buddha saw the world, uh, then of course we are very much on the right track. Yeah. So, uh, uh, for this reason, I'm going to start off again talking about the uh, a little bit about the significance uh, of the Buddha's teaching. So we're going to start with the first sutta. First sutta is about uh, is called the Future Perils. Uh, so we're going to start with that one, uh, and then um, uh, see where that takes us. Uh, Okay, so the future peril sutta. <clears throat> so this is uh, 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 one of many suttas that talk about the significance of the word of the Buddha, why it really matters, uh, why we should focus on this teachings. And uh, this one is very interesting because it uh, talks about the dangers in the future. Uh, the things that are going to lead to, in other words, lead to the decline of Buddhism and eventually the disappearance of Buddhism itself. And yeah, this is why this is very fascinating. Yeah. And uh, when is the future? Well, the future is now. Yeah, now is the future. Why this matters, sir? So, um, yeah, because the future is now, so the Buddha is really talking to our age, yeah, and he's maybe talking to even ages previous to this one. It's really relevant for now because now is the time we have the uh, these perils will have arisen. Now. So this is very relevant for us. So. so let's have a look at what the Buddha has to see in this particular sutta. Um, okay, so. This is from the Anguttara Nikaya, the numerical discourses of the Buddha, Sutta number 79. That's what that means, that little number there, top left hand corner, AN is Anguttara Nikaya, and numerical discourses, five, so that's the kind of chapter number, if you like, and 79 is the Sutta number. And this is what the Buddha has to say, because there are these five future, future perils as yet unarisen that will arise in the future. You should recognize them and make an effort to abandon them. What are these five? 
Yeah, so when there are dangers, we should uh, try to understand dangers uh, for what they are, uh, and then we should try to abandon these particular dangers. Uh, I should say maybe I said that you know the sutta starts with bhikkhus, uh, monks, uh, and uh, you may think that he's only talking to the monks, but uh, usually that's not the case. Uh, usually, when it starts with bhikkhus like that, it actually also includes the bhikkhunis. Uh, it may also include the lay people as well, the upasakas and upasakas. And the reason for that is because when the Buddha speaks, he speaks to the kind of the most senior part of the audience. And the most senior part would have been the bhikkhus. Yeah? It doesn't mean that there are the other people are not also included. It just means that they are not the ones that are addressed. And that's why it is phrased in this particular way. Yeah? So this really includes everyone. So uh, we should recognize these dangers and what are they? So uh, in the future, there will be bhikkhus who are undeveloped in body, undeveloped in virtuous behavior, undeveloped in mind, and undeveloped in wisdom. Yeah? They will give the full ordination to others, uh, but will not be able to train them in the higher virtuous behavior, in the higher mind and the higher wisdom. Uh, these two, these pupils too, will be undeveloped in body, virtuous behavior, mind and wisdom. Uh, they in turn will give the full ordination to others, but they too will not be able to train them in the higher virtuous behavior the higher mind and the higher wisdom. These pupils too will be undeveloped in body, virtuous behavior, uh, mind and wisdom. So uh, the idea here, and this is exactly uh, this is interesting. Yeah, every every sentence, every word is interesting. And sometimes you just have to dig into it a little bit to see what's going on. There. This is not the main thing I want to focus on, but because it is there, I thought I might as well. Bring it out, yeah, it's there anyway. So first of all, you start off with bhikkhus or bhikkhunis or anyone really uh, who are undeveloped in body, virtue, mind, and wisdom. Uh, yeah, and this is uh, what happens sometimes. Sometimes you get people who are not uh, maybe practicing the path to their full ability, who get sidetracked in all kinds of projects, who kind of are climbing the sangha hierarchy or are get consumed by status and all, all of these kind of things. And, and because you get sidetracked by worldly issues, uh, it means that you don't develop your mind in the right way. Uh, and this is what this really means. It's really all of these four factors, whether developed, undeveloped by body, by mind or wisdom, all of this really refers back to the development of the mind. Yeah, everything is really mind at the end of the day. Even your virtue comes from the mind. Uh, so it means that you haven't developed yourself properly. And if you don't develop yourself properly, then when you get disciples because you are an open donation to other people, then of course you won't be able to train them. Yeah, there's no chance that you will know what to do because you don't really understand the Dhamma. The less developed you are in these things, the less you understand, and the worse you will be as a teacher. And then the next generation too, they make the same mistake. You have the next generation to become obsessed with the worldly things and obsessed by uh, status and by gain and by etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and then this gets passed down from one generation to the next one. Uh, and um, when you think about it, you will see that many of the most successful ethics and maybe lay people as well in the world, uh, they are often quite rebellious. Yeah, they tend to be rebellious because they have to break out of the mold, the mold of people going in the wrong direction, being obsessed by the wrong things. Yeah? And this is what we see all the time. And so people like uh, Ajahn Chah, yeah, Ajahn Brahm's teacher in Thailand, for example, or Ajahn Man, who was his teacher in turn, uh, all of these tended to be rebellious. Uh, they did things in a different way. Uh, they uh, would... Uh, in a, in a sense, reject uh, the common way that the Dhamma was done in the world, yeah, because the real the Dhamma was corrupt. Uh, and then they would reject that, uh, and they would go back to the suttas, they would read these things, they would take the Vinaya seriously, the monastic rule seriously, and then they would start practicing it. 
So it is almost like the uh, Buddhism needs some of these uh, 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 rebellious people, that they need uh, people who are willing to go back to the roots, to go back to where the tradition comes from. Uh, and uh, this kind of means two things. You know, it means, first of all, that uh, the importance of the tradition or where it comes from, going back to the roots, uh, is obviously very important because uh, if the present day, the contemporary Buddhism is a little bit corrupted, uh, well, then you have to go back to the, to the roots. So there's no choice. Uh, so sometimes you need that uh, to take that special action to go back to the beginning again. Uh, but also it shows you the importance of having people who, who are trained, yeah, who are trained especially in the higher wisdom, uh, because these are the people who will be able to train others. Uh, if you have the higher higher wisdom it means that you understand what the Buddha was talking about. Uh, yeah, it means that you have an interest in a. Uh, you, you actually know what the training really is in, in the great detail and great profundity. And because of that, you can bring other people to the same level. Uh, it is the areas in the world, the noble ones in the world, uh, who have the ability to bring about other noble ones. Uh, and so it, there's two things here yeah, in, the, um, in Buddhism. There's two things that always come together. Uh, and one of those things is the ancient scriptures uh, of the Buddha uh, that go back to the the very beginning and we always have to provide the very foundation of buddhism this is like what i like to say is the gold standard this is what buddhism really is about this is how we know whether someone is teaching in the right way or not yeah so very it's absolutely crucial to have those teachings there as a background but also and this is kind of the tricky part we need the living example of those teachings practiced in the right way yeah the people who are developed in body, in, a, in virtue, in mind, and in wisdom. And when you have those two pillars of Buddhism, then Buddhism will always prosper. But if you lose one of those, yeah, then you have a problem. Because then yeah, there is a lack of, first of all, maybe a lack of foundation, a teaching of the Buddha disappears, and a lack of understanding if the areas are not there. So these two things really have to come together. Of these two, the most important one is the teachings of the Buddha, that we have the scriptures, yeah, because that provides the basis for everything else. So that is the most important part. But uh, uh, ideally, we have both of these things coming together. So I don't know about you, uh, how each one of you thinks about this, uh, uh, but for me, it's always been so important to find teachers in the world who really practice the Dhamma fully. You get the feeling when you are in the presence of some of, some, of, some of these teachers that uh, this is the living thing. This is the real Dhamma. This is the Dhamma expressed through bodily action, through verbal action, uh, through the entire conduct, through the loving kindness and compassion of these people. Uh, and it's so powerful when you see that because you can see being in the presence of the Buddha almost, the presence of these teachings. Uh, so it is really, it matters enormously Honestly, at least for me, it matters enormously to have that uh, sense of being in the presence of something living and beautiful. So these are the two things, yeah, the Dhamma, the ancient teachings, and also the living masters in contemporary Buddhism. And that can be, could be bhikkhus, it can be bhikkhunis, yeah, monks or nuns. Uh, uh, and sometimes it can also be lay people. Occasionally, I have found lay people in my life who have been extraordinarily inspiring uh, and uh, almost practicing, I think, to the very end of the path. Uh, so it's, uh, it's fascinating how you, you find uh, that understanding, that depth of development in uh, all the four parisas. The four parisas, of course, being the bhikkhus, the bhikkhunis, the upasakas and the upasakas. Uh, so what do we mean by, you know, it, it says there, maybe to you, it is a bit cryptic. It says undeveloped in body, in virtue, mind and wisdom. What exactly do these four mean? And maybe the most cryptic one is being undeveloped in body. We're still on point one. We're still on point one, please. Point one. Up, 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 up. No, up, other way, the other way, please. Yeah, keep going up, all the way up, up, more, all the way up, more, 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 yep, yeah. okay, that's too much. 
Um, okay, anyway, so I'll just carry on. So there is um, in, in point one there, yeah, five, consider five cent, five cent to nine point one, yes, that, that's the one during the life experiment. Okay. And um, you see there the uh, development by body, virtue, mind, and wisdom, yeah, which is in there. And uh, so what does it mean? And uh, uh, virtue, I think we all know what that means, or, or do we? Maybe we don't. <laughs> virtue is very profound, yeah, and virtue is very deep in Buddhism. And I think this is one of the most, uh, in many ways, one of the most beautiful aspects of the Buddhist teachings, uh, is the profundity of the virtue, uh, and just how we live with each other in ordinary life. Uh, and uh, so this even just developing that virtue, even thinking about what it means to be virtuous in a deep sense, what it means to be moral, uh, the idea of kindness, uh, the idea of uh, developing even your mind yeah, in a virtuous way, all of that is part of what the idea of virtue is. Uh, so, uh, yeah, anyway, so we, maybe we'll come back to that later on. Uh, but then there is the idea of being undeveloped in body, which may seem strange. Yeah, what does that got to do with body? I'm not sure that body is irrelevant. This is a mental training, right? I don't know why, why the body is in there. And uh, the, what is interesting about this, it shows you that this word body in Buddhism is quite a uh, unusual word. The Pali word is kaya, and it doesn't mean physical body. It means almost like the body of your personality and who you are as a person. So development of body refers largely to the uh, how we deal with the senses, uh, the five senses, yeah? that we don't allow ourselves to be uh, kind of too much uh, distracted by the five senses in the world, getting upset about things in the world, getting too many unwholesome desires and all that kind of thing. Yeah. That is the idea of development of the body. The five senses obviously are connected to the body, yeah? So maybe that is in part what is meant here. And then you have the development of mind, which obviously refers to the uh, samadhi practices, uh, yeah, the deep meditations and all of that, a very important part of the path, uh, yeah? Uh, and uh, certainly fundamental on the Noble Eightfold Path, which ends with samma, samadhi, that is all about the development of the mind. Uh, and then the last one here, the development of the wisdom. Uh, this is uh, the profoundest part of the Buddhist path. Uh, and this is where you find the area symbol ones, yeah? the ones who have developed uh, wisdom properly. Only then, when you have fully developed all the way, only then are you really able to teach others all the way to the same kind of goal. Uh, so that is what we should be aiming at. We should be aim aiming at having wise people uh, in the Buddhist community, and when we have that, then uh, we have also the future also stabilized as a consequence. Yeah, the future is here. This is all about the future. Future, so that wisdom is really one of the critical aspects here. Yeah? And then it says at the in the same paragraph, at the end, we haven't really uh, looked at that yet. It says. Uh, uh, in this way, because uh, through the corruption of the Dharma comes the corruption of the training. Uh, and from the corruption of the training comes the corruption of the Dhamma. This is the first future peril as yet unarisen that will arise in the future. Uh, you should recognize it and make an effort to abandon it. Uh, so uh, a corruption of the Dhamma, yeah, this is because the previous generation, they don't understand the teaching properly, they don't understand what is going on because they haven't practiced properly. So because the Dhamma is corrupted, it means that you cannot train in the right way. You don't understand the teachings in the right way and the training is uh, compromised as a consequence. Uh, the Pali word for training here is uh, Vinaya. Yeah, Vinaya is quite interesting. Vinaya is usually understood to mean the uh, monastic discipline, yeah, the rules for the monastics and the and all the uh, procedures that we all do in the monastic community, uh, all of that is part of the what is usually called the vinaya pitaka. But here it means something else. It means like the training in the very broad sense. 
So you can think, if you like, the Dhamma on the one hand is the uh, doctrine, the teachings of the Buddha, and then how you apply those teachings in your life, yeah, how you live the Dhamma, that is then the Vinaya. So Dhamma is like theory, and Vinaya can be considered a practice, it's how we actually live out that theory. Yeah. So if you misunderstand the Dhamma, your, your training is going to be no good. And if you don't train properly, then there's no way you're going to be able to understand the Dhamma because you have to train. So the whole thing gets destroyed in this way. Yeah? These two things always have to go together. Uh, on the one hand, the understanding of the teachings. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a training in accordance with those teachings. Uh, and if you don't have that, uh, then you have a problem. Uh, so uh, for this reason, it really matters that we seek out the teachings. Uh, and we've come to the bottom, understand what these things really are about, and, and then there is a chance that we will be on the right track. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, that is the first one. Let's go to the second point. And uh, uh, this is very similar to the previous one. Uh, <clears throat> and the difference here is only that the, that the previous one is about uh, teachers, uh, yeah, how to teach. Uh, this one is about um, so uh oh another. Okay, hello everyone. So <laughs> here we are again. Um, okay, let's just carry on. I'm not sure what happened there. Let's just uh, continue what we're doing. So the, uh, the second paragraph here is uh, basically the same as the previous one. Yeah, the previous one, uh, we were talking about the uh, 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 yeah. How if you don't practice the Dhamma properly, and then you will not train pro properly, etc. There will be this mutual problem between the two. Yeah? And uh, now uh, the only difference here is that we're talking about a teacher rather than a preceptor. So if you have a teacher who doesn't understand properly, you have a problem. If you have a preceptor who doesn't understand properly, you have the same problem, basically. So nothing uh, too interesting. So let's go down to the third point. Uh, so here, <clears throat> the uh, Buddha says, uh, in the future there will be uh, bhikkhus uh, who are undeveloped in body, virtue, mind, and wisdom, uh, while engaged in talk pertaining to the Dhamma, in questions and answers, uh, they will slide down into a dark Dhamma, but will not recognize it. Yeah, so uh, here, uh, very similar to what we had before, uh, but here the idea is that if you haven't developed your mind properly, if you haven't got the insight into the teachings, if you're not an Arya, if you're not a noble person, then you tend to be led astray. Yeah, you are led astray by what exactly? Well, you are led astray by your defilement. <laughs> but even more profoundly than that, what is really leads people astray is the sense of self. Yeah, the I is always there in the background, and the I creates such enormous problems uh, because it distorts our outlook of these teachings, uh, and that is really a main problem. Uh, so uh, uh, 
And it is a main problem because it is such a profound and difficult thing to see. Yeah, the I, this is the idea of sunyata in Buddhism in non-self. And, and it is so, so profound and so hard to see yeah, that uh, we tend to want to avoid it because precisely because of that. Uh, so if you're not developed in mind, you haven't actually seen these teachings, uh, there's a very great chance uh, that you will be led astray by your default, by your delusion, and by your wrong views. Uh, and because of that, you will slide into a, a dark dhamma. What does dark dhamma mean? And uh, it is not entirely clear, but uh, it could mean uh, anything like a wrong view, for example. Yeah, there's a very, very strong tendency that you mind to have wrong view. Because uh, when you have, uh, if you don't understand things right, and wrong view, it tends to be a natural consequence of, uh, it's actually part of it, yeah? And then you will lead a bit astray as a, as a consequence. So. so for that reason, we have exactly the same problem as before, yeah? Through the corruption of the Dhamma comes the corruption of the training. So here, the training. And from the corruption of the training comes the corruption of the Dhamma. This is the third future peril as yet an arisen that will arise in the future. You should recognize it and make an effort to abandon it. Okay, uh, let's go on to the next, the fourth point. And... Uh, So here we come to the, uh, the point that I really wanted to talk about because it is perhaps the most clear one about uh, uh, why the suttas are so important. Uh, yeah? And the book says, again, in the future, there will be bhikkhus who are undeveloped in body, virtue, mind, and wisdom. Uh, when those discourses spoken by the Tathagata, the Tathagata is the Buddha, are being recited that are deep, deep in meaning, world transcending, uh, connected with emptiness, uh, they will not want to listen to them, uh, not lend an ear to them, uh, or apply their minds to understand them. Uh, they will not think those teachings should be studied and learned. Uh, but when those teachings are being recited that are mere poetry, composed by poets, uh, beautiful in words and phrases, created by outsiders, uh, spoken by disciples, uh, they will want to listen to them, lend an ear to them, and apply their minds to understand them. Uh, they will think that those teachings uh, should be studied and learned. Yeah, so here we are directly comparing the word of the Buddha. Yeah, the discourse is spoken by the Agatha. This is the word of the Buddha. We are directly comparing that uh, to discourses spoken by anyone else. Uh, yeah, this is what that really means. Anyone else really is the uh, comparison. And uh, first of all, it has a, a description of the word of the Buddha, why the word of the Buddha are so special. <laughs> and uh, of course, you have here the idea that it is deep and deep in meaning, or you could say deep in goal, deep in aim, deep in purpose. Uh, the um, Pali here is Gambir Atta, and Gambira means profound, but Atta means like the goal of the practice. Uh, yeah? In Pali, we have these two words, we have Dhamma and we have Atta. Dhamma is the uh, doctrine that we are dealing with. It is a teaching that we get from the Buddha. But then those teachings, they have a purpose. Uh, yeah? Where are they heading here? Yeah? And of course, where they are heading is also the Nibbana, but they're also heading towards a, a general sense of well-being, a general sense of happiness, a, a reduction in problems in life, and all of these kind of things. Yeah. So these are deep in the sense that when you read them, they are inspiring and meaningful and all of that. But also deep in meaning, in the sense that the goal is truly profound. The goal is truly meaningful. We're heading towards something that actually gives a very profound sense of meaning in our lives. So, and this is really important. It's not a superficial thing. It's not about kind of just making up our lives better. You know, I can be a better parent and I can be a better at work. Of course, it's good too. But that is only a superficial part of it. It is deep in meaning that it truly 
brings about a very profound change. Uh, it really brings about a sense of uh, reaching the very meaning of life itself uh, when you practice these teachings. Yeah? So deep as a teaching, but also deep as a consequence when you practice these teachings. Uh, and part of the reason why it is so deep in meaning is the next word here, yeah? uh, world transcending here. Yeah? In other words, going beyond the world. And uh, I don't know what you think about world transcending, if you think that's a good idea or not. Uh, but um, what exactly does it mean when we say world transcending? Well, the Pali word for world is actually uh, also itself quite new. It has different degrees to it. Uh, but the first kind of world that we want to transcend uh, the ordinary world of the five senses. Uh, yeah, the world that we have when we wake up in the morning, uh, the world that we are in throughout the day until we go to bed at night, uh, that is the world of the five senses. And the spiritual practice is really about going beyond that. Uh, and now we can see this is kind of the beginning point of what is so profound. Yeah, the idea of going beyond the ordinary world of the senses. Uh, why do we even want to do that? And a very big part of uh, understanding Buddhism in the right way is to under understand why it is worthwhile going beyond that world. Uh, and the reason, of course, in large part is because that world is unreliable. Uh, it is uncertain. Uh, you cannot control it. Uh, it is always going to disappoint you, always going to lead to problems. Uh, yeah, We see that now so clearly in our lives. We see that with the uh, COVID situation. We see that the, you know in all the instability in politics around the world, we see it in climate change, we see it with so many things, uh, how out of control that world actually is. And uh, also in the personal realm as well, yeah, with people getting sick and dying and all of these kind of things, uh, that world is inherently problematic. Yeah? And that is why this idea of transcending the world, uh, going beyond the world, is such a powerful idea in the Buddhist teachings. Uh, you leave that world behind it. You move towards something more meaningful, something more profound, uh, something which actually has the ability to uh, give you real satisfaction. Yeah, the world will never be able to give you that satisfaction, but, but uh, the world can if you practice it in the right way, especially if you develop your mind in the right way. Yeah. So the Buddhist teachings are, this is why they are so marvelous. Yeah, this is why they are so Precisely because they give this profundity and depth of meaning and all of these kind of things. So, so it's kind of a wow. The more you understand about the Dhamma, the more wow you feel. Yeah, so hopefully you will feel a bit of wow during this retreat. Because that's kind of what I'm here for. So every time you feel wow, then uh, you, uh, you think, gee, this is actually really cool. So I hope that's how you feel. That's how I feel sometimes. Uh, because it is really something very, very special and precious that we have with us. Uh, of course, the idea of world transcending goes even further, because even the world of the mind, when you go inwards, when you find that peace and bliss and all these kind of things inside, and even that world ultimately is unstable. So ultimately, we have to go even beyond that. But if we are able to just go beyond the ordinary world, first of all, we have already taken a very large step on the way, the path towards awakening itself. And then we come to the very last part here of uh, why the word of the Buddha is so special. Yeah, it is connected with emptiness. Uh, and this is uh, the most profound part of the Buddhist teachings. Uh, this is what has to do with non-self. It has to do with the fact that uh, if you look inside, ultimately, there is nothing inherent inside of us to be found. Nothing which is absolutely stable, always uh, a thing we can fall back upon as the real me. It doesn't actually exist. There's emptiness inside that. And of course, this is what leads ultimately to the highest wisdom of these Buddhist teachings. And this is very important. I think a lot of Dhamma around the world, they get this part of the Dhamma wrong. They don't really um, grasp fully the idea of emptiness and what that means. And this then becomes very dramatic for the passing on of the Buddhist teachings. So, so uh, this is a teaching of the Buddha, yeah, profound, meaningful, giving you the very purpose of life. Uh, there's something about them that is very, very attractive and very, very uh, 
something that everyone, if you think about them in the right way, will really should really be leaning towards. Uh, and this is what is happening here. Uh, so what? And but sometimes, yeah, if you are not developed at all in body, virtue, mind, or wisdom, uh, you won't be interested in those teachings. Uh, you won't be interested because you don't understand how powerful they are. You have no idea. You tend to be uh, instead interested in the worldly things, to be sidetracked by all the worldly things in the world, things that seem so beautiful, uh, but actually don't have the same kind of depth. Yeah. So you put the teachings of the Buddha to one side and you come back instead to uh, listening to things that have been instead uh, spoken by other people. And this is what it says here, yeah? It talks about uh, those discourses that are mere poetry composed by poets, uh, beautiful in words and phrases, uh, created by outsiders, uh, spoken by disciples. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, often we are attracted to things that are beautiful. So beautiful, poetry, wow, it's so nice. Uh, but uh, reality may not be much more than uh, superficially beautiful. The content may not be all that, in, all that profound. Uh, yeah, created by outsiders, created by people outside of Buddhism. That's what that refers to. Uh, and uh, so uh, and very common in the Buddhist world to be too excited by things that are even outside of the Buddhist teachings. Uh, yeah, whatever uh, teaching it is, whether it, it is a uh, Hinduism or Christianity or whatever, people get excited by these things. And uh, the last one, which to me is maybe the most interesting one, uh, is the idea of being spoken by disciples. Uh, yeah, and uh, the Buddha. It's basically saying that anything spoken by disciples uh, is always going to be not as profound, not as uh, uh, meaningful, not as conducive to leading towards awakening uh, as the word of the Buddha himself. And remember that spoken by disciples means everybody. Yeah? It means everybody in the world apart from the Buddha. Uh, if you uh, were to meet an Arahant in the present day, and of course, you can never really know whether you're an arahant or not. But even if you were to meet an arahant, the way they teach, the way they present the Dhamma, yeah, will not tend to be as complete or as, uh, um, uh, as uh, detailed as the teaching of the Buddha. The Buddha is more precise, more correct, leading you more in the right direction, uh, yeah? whereas the uh, uh, disciples often are not. Uh, so this is why it is so important to come back to the word of the Buddha. In any case, we don't know who the Arahants are. Yeah? It's hard enough to know whether someone is really well practiced, let alone to know whether they are an Arahant or a streamer. Very difficult to know. And because of that, the coming back to the word of the Buddha is so essential. So there you are. Yeah? Really, I find this very fascinating myself. And... Uh, I think one of the things to understand is also that this is not the only place in the suttas uh, where the Buddha talks about this. Uh, he talks about this uh, also in, uh, in, in a number of other suttas, not least uh, in the Maha Parivana Sutta, where he is about to pass away. Yeah? He talks about who is going to be the teachers uh, of the Buddhist community after his own demise. Uh, and of course, what he says is that uh, the teacher should be the Dhamma that he has taught. Uh, and the vinaya, the training that arises from that Dhamma. So it is like a, a theme that you find in the suttas. Come back to the word of the Buddha. Come back to these teachings that, that you will be on the right track. Yeah. So uh, then uh, the Buddha carries on just like before. And that's because through a corruption of the Dhamma, uh, there is a corruption of the training. And from the corruption of the training comes the corruption of the Dhamma. This is the fourth huge peril as yet unarisen that will arise in the future. You should recognize it and make an effort to abandon it. Let's have a quick look, look at the last one. Again, in the future, there will be bhikkhus who are undeveloped in body, uh, virtue, mind, and wisdom. The elder being undeveloped in body, virtue, mind, and wisdom uh, 
will be luxurious and lax, leaders in backsliding, uh, discarding the duty of solitude. Uh, they will not arouse energy for the attainment of the yet, of the as yet unattained, uh, for the achievement of the as yet unachieved, uh, for the realization of the as yet unrealized. Uh, those in the next generation will follow their example. Uh, they too will be luxurious and lax, uh, leaders in backsliding, uh, discarding the beauty of solitude. Uh, they too will not arouse energy for the attainment of the as yet unattained, uh, for the achievement of the as yet unachieved, uh, for the realization of the as yet unrealized. Uh, so, uh, uh, the point of this is simply that if you uh, have not developed uh, your mind properly, then your mind will tend towards worldly things. Yeah, if we don't find the uh, joy and satisfaction in the Dhamma, then the mind will tend towards uh, enjoying the world. Yeah, you will tend to be luxurious, you will tend to be lax, uh, you will tend to be a leader in backsliding. Yeah. I don't know, I like that. Phrase leader backside doesn't sound very good, uh, going backwards very fast. Uh, and if you are a leader in that, it's obviously not a good idea. Or uh, even being a follower is bad, better than being a leader in backsliding. So, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, very importantly here, discarding the duty of solitude. Yeah, because uh, solitude is where deep meditation happens. Uh, and if you don't practice the path properly, if you are interested in the worldly things, then the mind will not incline towards solitude. You will have no interest in solitude because solitude only makes sense if you already have a sense of peace, if you already have a sense of virtue in your heart, then solitude starts to make sense. But without that, uh, those foundational things, uh, solitude doesn't work anymore. And solitude is so, such an important part of the Buddhist path because that is where the deep meditation happens, and that is where the wisdom happens, yeah, especially at the very deeper levels of these things. And, and without that, there is no real achievement, attainment, realization of all the things that we try to realize in this world. Yeah. So um, this is something to look out for yeah, in the monastic community, especially uh, the problem of uh, being too luxurious in this, in this life. And then you have serious, serious problems as a consequence. So uh, there you are. Those are the uh, five uh, problems. Uh, yeah, the five main perils for the future. And uh, we know that we are in the future now because if you look very carefully, you will see that all of those five perils, uh, they are found in the existing world. Uh, yeah, they're found a lot. Uh, and it means that we have to be very careful with how we... Uh, practice the Dhamma and uh, where we find our inspiration. Uh, and it means that to a large extent, we have to uh, rely on the suttas uh, as the arbiter, as the one, as where we can actually decide uh, what is the real teachings uh, and what is not. Uh. So um, that is uh, uh, the first sutta. And uh, I will uh, uh, stop there for uh, just a few minutes. And, and this is just to give you a little bit of background. And this is uh, usually just to explain to you uh, why I like to focus on these teachings and uh, to give you an idea of what I'm up to and why we're going to look at this uh, more in depth of these teachings just, uh, uh, just after a very short break. Yeah. So, uh, but before we get on to the uh, real suttas and carry on, let's just take a short break uh, and maybe five minutes or so, so I'd say to nine. Uh, nine and uh, fifty, yeah, and then we will carry on. Just have a short meditation break, yeah, and then start at like nine fifty. Yeah.
Okay. <coughs> okay, everyone, let's uh, carry on now. Sorry about that, let's have a little bit of coffee just to kind of get myself going and a bit of uh, false, false energy just to make things work. So um, now we have just basically looked at what I would consider the uh, introduction to all of this and, and now we're going to come down to the uh, real suttas that are more meaningful in terms of practice and, and the Kind of backbone sutta for this retreat, and this is a sutta uh, that I used re recently on another retreat. And I was going to basically do a very similar kind of thing that I did recently. Uh, the sutta is called the Sabhasa Sutta, called also known as All the Defilements. That's how it's translated here. Uh, and this sutta is found in the middle length of the Buddha, the Majjhimanikaya, uh, the second sutta. And uh, what is uh, interesting about the suttas of the Buddha, to give you a little bit of understanding what this sutta is about, is that they are they all tend to uh, be very similar in the way they are structured. The more you understand the suttas, the more you understand that there are different angles on the same thing, yeah? different angles on the same practice, uh, different angles on the same view, the same outlook, the same doctrine, if you like. Yeah? And the more you understand that, the more you can start to see all the suttas uh, as part of this large jigsaw puzzle. There is one picture, but you can look at that picture from different angles, different vantage points, different views. Uh, and this uh, particular sutta is one of these views, uh, one of these ways of understanding the Dhamma. Uh, the most uh, uh, common way of thinking about the Dhamma, and especially the practice of the Dhamma, is the uh, the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, yeah, beginning with right view and then going all the way to Samma Samadhi. Yeah, so this is kind of the standard way. Another way to think about the uh, practice of the Dhamma is the, what I call the gradual training. Uh, and this is found in many, many places in the suttas. Uh, and for example, if you look at the, uh, the, uh, uh, the fruits of reclusion, the Sankhapala Sutta, the second sutta of the Diga Nikaya, you find that. Uh, or if you look at the Chula Hatti Padopama Sutta, the, uh, uh, the, the shorter sutta on the elephant's footprint, uh, which is also a very famous sutta. Uh, it also has the same structure. Yeah? And uh, the Sasana Sutta is uh, surprisingly the same thing. Yeah? It's the same kind of structure. Uh, and what it shows you, it shows you how you basically how you start out in the Buddhist practice, uh, and then how gradually by starting out from a certain point, uh, you take it deeper and deeper and deeper, all the way till you reach the end of the path. Uh, it's like a comprehensive understanding of the Buddhist practice. Uh, and this is what makes it so interesting, yeah, because we all fit in to that comprehensive understanding somewhere. Every one of us is going to be somewhere on that, in that practice, uh, starting at the beginning, going all the way to the end. Uh, so these teachings are meant for every one of us, uh, and every one of us will benefit from these things. Uh, and if you understand where you are on that framework, it means that you know what you need to do, yeah? And uh, so this can often be very useful. Very often, in I think, in Buddhist life, we don't really understand what is important for me to do. What should I be doing? What should be my emphasis? Uh, how much time should I be spending in meditation practice? Uh, how, much, how often should I be going on retreat? Uh, yeah? Um, how should I practice virtue? How much should I focus on the mind? How much should I focus on just body and speech? And, and all of these things that become clear when you start to understand the gradual training in the right way. Yeah? You know roughly where you are at, what your problems are, and then you practice at that point in the training. Yeah? This is so important because we can waste so much time doing things that are not really appropriate. Yeah? Some 
people are not ready for meditation practice. Uh, yeah, we often say meditation is the most important thing in Buddhist practice. But the most important thing in Buddhist practice is really kindness, because kindness is at the basis of everything else. Uh, and if you can be really, really kind in your life, uh, meditation will happen automatically. Uh, yeah, this is such an important point, and I'd like to emphasize this always. I don't think you can really overemphasize it, uh, because uh, uh, it, it's difficult to always be kind. It's difficult to be always caring and always looking after yourself and people around you. But it's such an important point. Uh, get this right, and everything else tends to fall into place. Uh, yeah, that's how important it really is. Uh, so we need to understand what to prioritize, uh, what really matters in our life. Uh, uh, and then gradually, as we do that, we uh, start to make good progress. So, so this is um, this particular sutta called the Savasava Sutta, and is one particular way of thinking about this gradual training. Yeah? Uh, and uh, the way it thinks about it is in terms of this, these things we call defilements, yeah? Sub asava. Sabba, yeah? Sabba in Pali means all. Uh, and asava means uh, like it is here translated as defilement, uh, uh, which I think is a, a good translation. Yeah, you can translate it as defilements if you like, or maybe as uh, uh, corruptions or something like that. Uh, but uh, it is a very specific kind of defilement. And usually the way that the word asava uh, is used in the suttas, uh, it is used as the most foundational, the most deep-seated defilements. Uh, that we have as human beings. And usually they are counted as three. Yeah, there is the, what you call the Kama Asava. Kama is the sensory world, the world we inhabit almost all the time in our daily life, the world of the five senses, and also our attachment and desires for that world of the five senses. Yeah, that's the Kama Asava. Then you have the Bhava Asava. Bhava means like existence. Uh, including, of course, the idea of rebirth. Uh, yes. So it can be really a different a desires rebirth in the future or the defilement that desires existence. Because we think existence is great. Yeah, we would rather exist than not exist. Uh, and if people say they're going to kill you, 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 you say, no, thank you, thank you for your offer, but I, I will decline today. Yeah, that's usually what we say. Maybe not today, maybe some other time. I, you know, I need, a bit, I need to think about this idea of dying. So give me a few, you know, a few weeks at least, and I'll think about this. So what is it that stops you from wanting to die? Well, it is basically the Bab Asala. Yeah, it, this, it kind of rejoices in the idea of existence. Uh, and it wants to carry that existence also into the future. And that's why it can be called the defilement of desire for rebirth. It's not an entirely wrong way of thinking about it. Uh, and then, and there is the last of the asava, which is the abhij asava. And the abhij asava means like the defilement uh, of uh, ignorance or the defilement of delusion, the defilement of wrong view, if you like, of not seeing the world in the right way. And this in, uh, uh, is the, uh, in some ways, the most profound one, yeah, uh, because it goes to the very root of the problem of why we. Uh, why we have the other asavas, uh, the idea that we are seeing a self where there is, where there is no self and all of these kind of things. Uh. Um, so these are the three asavas. Uh, and uh, of those three, the most uh, important one for the vast majority of people is the first one, the calm asava, the defilements, uh, desire for the sensory world. Uh. Yeah, this is the most profound because, or, or the most obvious one because this is what is... Uh, if we can deal with that one, uh, then the two other answers are actually fairly easy to deal with, uh, because this is uh, where we are trapped. Yeah, we tend. This is why our meditation doesn't deepen. Uh, this is why we sometimes don't practice morality properly, because we are so attached to that world, we are willing to be immoral so we can gain things in that world of the five senses. Uh, so understanding the karma of our deep. Dealing with that one is really, uh, I think, the most important one. Uh, and then the, uh, the Baba Sava, the defilement of uh, existence, uh, is far less problematic. And that tends to unravel almost as a matter of course. Uh, so these are what is meant here by the word Asava. In this particular uh, 
uh, sutta, uh, the word is used a little bit differently. Uh, here it is used more in a sense of defilements in a more general sense. Uh, and you will see that as we go through the suttas, they're talking about defilements very broadly. Uh, yeah. And uh, so it's a bit different here, but the main scheme of the three asavas can still be used uh, because uh, a lot of uh, the asavas in ordinary life, they relate to the first one, the calm asava, the, the defilement of uh, desire in the sensory world, or just the defilements of the sensory world, if you like. Yeah. Um, so uh, that gives you a little bit of background. Yeah? And, and again, they are very profound, these asavas. Uh, uh, there is another way of understanding them, which I thought I might just talk about very briefly. Uh, there's often a big debate about how a word asava should be translated. What does it actually mean? The translation that you see on the screen now, defilement, this is a translation by a monk called Ajahn Sujato. Uh, some of you may know what it is about. Uh, and this is his translation of this word. Uh, I know. Ajahn Brahm, uh, who you all know, I presume. Uh, yeah, I, you may all know, but it's unlikely that any of you haven't heard about Ajahn Brahm. Everyone seems to have heard about Ajahn Brahm. Uh, he's my teacher, of course, here at Bodhinyana Monastery. And he likes to translate Asa as outflowing. Yeah? As outflowing. What does that mean? What, why outflowing? Yeah? It's an interesting one, isn't it? What is it? When the, sometimes when you dig into the meaning of these words, you kind of learn a lot about the Dhamma. So why does asava, why does it be outflowing here? And uh, the answer is that the word asava itself is related to the word sav, yeah, asav. And the word sav or savati actually is about the flowing of things. Uh, yeah, things flowing in the world. Maybe a river can be said to flow in this way. Yeah? So the word asava has a relation to the idea of flow. And uh, then you have the a ah in the beginning, ah, sabati, and that a ah can mean either in or out. Yeah, so flow out is outflowing. Flowing in is inflowing, or it can also be called influx. Yeah, so influx is another translation of the word asava. So which one of all of these is right? <laughs> I hope you're not getting a headache already from my details are going into the Pali language. I hope you can you are with me on this because it is actually it is actually quite interesting once you start to really understand what is going on here. So which one of these is right? And uh, there's a lot of debate about these words and because of that it is very hard to say which one is right in the ultimate sense. Uh, but there are suttas that talk about, for example, if, if you have a wound, a wound or a sore on your arm, for example, uh, if it gets infected, then you may have pus coming out of that wound. Yeah, and that pus is said to be an asava in the sutta. The pus is asava because it flows out of the wound. The pus comes out. Yeah. So uh, and it is also a defilement. Yeah? It is something very ne negative. We don't really like pus and wounds. It's kind of unpleasant. And uh, so it fits quite well with. Uh, uh, the idea of asava in the suttas is outflowing. So outflowing is not a bad translation. What does it mean? In what sense can we talk about outflowing? And what you will notice with your own mind, yeah, if you watch yourself carefully, you will see how your mind tends to go out into the world. Yeah, you go out, you want to see things that are nice, yeah like seeing your good friends in the Buddhist fellowship, for example. Yeah, it's not like see things that are nice, but also seeing the sensory things of the world. Yeah, I'm going to go down to lunch soon, and then I will see this big table of food in front of me, the asavas, which goes out to that food on the table. Or it can be anything like that in the world. When we enjoy the world, the things, the mind goes out into the world. Yeah, it goes out to the music. It goes out to the in your mouth of the food. It goes out to watch the beautiful scenery, watch the movies. It goes out to touch things with your body. Oh, that's a ni nice and pleasant touch. Yeah, whatever that, that might be. And uh, so it's always this idea of going out. And you can see, because this is always about the five senses, yeah, that's how the mind goes out into the world. Uh, you can see why uh, outflowing, especially I talked before about the 
come as the answer of desire in the world of the five senses, in the mind flowing out into that world, going out into the world. And I, I'm pretty sure you can all relate to what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's very easy to understand that uh, because uh, uh, it, uh, this is almost literally what the mind does, uh, seeking happiness in that world, attaching in that world, desiring in that world, looking for things, always looking around. Yeah, can I see something nice? Can I taste something nice? Yeah, that's why we travel overseas because we want to see something beautiful, we taste some new food, we want to experience something else. Uh, this is the mind going out into the world. So uh, in that sense, it makes really good sense. Yeah, you can think about this in terms of the outflowing of mind into the world. And that is very problematic. Why is that problematic? Well, if the world outside is really problematic, if it is always letting you down, if it never gives you the stability of the happiness, that you want that world. If it is always changing, finally you have time, found something nice in the world, and then it changes. Climate change comes, politics messes things up. Um, COVID comes, yeah, we, have, we have, have just been through, we're almost kind of perhaps coming to the end of this COVID pandemic now, but who knows when the next COVID comes around, next COVID, and COVID being a metaphor for anything that goes wrong in the world. Uh, and this, the world is just so inherently unreliable. So the more we go out into the world, the more of a problem we have. And the more we attach to that, the more we fall to that, the more we block our ability from going inside instead. Because going inside is the opposite of going out. Yeah? So it is, a, it is a blockage that stops us from actually achieving meditation. And this is why this becomes so important. This idea of the asava yeah, being a defilement flowing out into the world becomes a very beautiful way of thinking about the, uh, the, the problems that we encounter in our spiritual practice. So um, you could argue that a similar thing can also be argued for the other asava. I, I mentioned before the idea of the bald asava. The, uh, the defilement of desire for existence, yeah? And um, that is a little bit similar. It's the mind going into the future very often, in the future, into some desired state. I want to be like this, yeah? And that future can be very soon or it can be far away in a future life. Yeah? But this idea of you want to be somebody, somebody in a certain way, that is the Bhav Asava. It's also a kind of outflowing moving towards something else, uh, going to a different place. Uh, it's not being happy in the moment and just allowing things of the world to be. So that is the uh, title of the sutta. It talks about all of these kind of defilements. Uh, so uh, I don't know what you think about that, whether you think that's a good starting point or not, but uh, and you don't have much chance to give me feedback on what you think, so we're just going to have to do it. Uh, yeah? So hopefully you will uh, find something suitable, something useful in all of this. And so let's see what the Buddha has to say. So <clears throat> this is how the sutta starts, like all of the sutta. So, so I have heard that at one time the Buddha was staying near Sabati in Jeta's grove, another pin, because monastery. There the Buddha addressed the mendicants. Mendicants, venerable sir, they replied. And the Buddha said this. Mendicants, I will teach you the explanation of the restraint of all defilements. Listen and pay close attention. I will speak. Yes, sir, they replied. And the Buddha said this. So let's stop there because uh, that is already uh, quite interesting. Here. And um, just to comment on a couple of the things here. Uh, one of the things that uh, recently caught my eye, which is quite uh, nice about this introduction here, it starts off by saying, uh, in Jaita's grove, Jaita was a prince in India, and he was the one who owned this 
grove before. Uh, this is a uh, Jeta Bana. Bana means like grove or forest or park or something. Uh, and then he sold that to Anatta Pindika, yeah, who then made it into a monastery. That's why it's called Anatta Pindika's monastery. But um, if you are really, really sharp and if you know your sutta as well, you will know that the translation here is not always Anatta Pindika's monastery. Sometimes it is Anatta Pindika's park. Yeah, Anatta Pindika's park. I don't, you probably may have seen that, at least those of you who have been around for. A long, long time. You may re remember that. So, which one is right? Is it another Pindika's park or is it monastery? Well, the Pali word here is Arama, and Arama means like a delightful place. Yeah, Aramata means to delight in something, to really enjoy something. So, Arama is like a delightful place. And in India, like uh, anywhere else around the world, they would have these places where people would enjoy themselves. And they would go out for the day and they would uh, have a, you know, a good time. And, uh, and so that, and, and, this, the, and these were often the aramas, yeah, the places that actually people enjoyed in this way. They would be like parks. Uh, that people would find very useful. And these parks were then often given to the monastic Sangha. Yeah, so they actually gave places that were very, in, in some ways, quite beautiful yeah, to, the, uh, uh, to the monastics to stay. Uh, they would stay in places that actually were quite nice. And uh, this is kind of interesting. Yeah? It, it's kind of fascinating because it says something about the way that uh, monasticism worked, it was especially in the beginning, yeah. you wouldn't go to a very tough place, a place that was very austere or very difficult, uh, you would go to a place that literally was an arama, that was delightful, a place that you could actually enjoy, yeah, and that's why the word for monastery and the way for park both mean a delightful place, a place where you delight, the natural scenery is quite nice, uh, and you can be quite relaxed and you can enjoy yourself. Yeah? So this is uh, uh, what I, I think is quite interesting because it says something about the way that the monasticism, the bhikkhus and the bhikkhunis would live. They would live in a place that was, was not important, but it was relaxed, it was at ease, and it was delightful in that sense. And uh, now that I think about it, if you go back to the... Um, um, uh, by autobiography of the Buddha that talks about his own life. And you may remember at the very, just before his awakening, yeah, he goes to the Niranjana River. And when he goes to the Niranjana River, he goes to a delightful place, yeah? a beautiful grove on the banks of the river uh, Niranjana where he can easily bathe, he can easily find water to drink. Yeah? And that is where he uh, reaches his awakening, yeah, in a delightful grove. The idea is to have this balance, yeah? not so austere as to be painful, not so indulgent as to, you know, that you're indulging the senses, but in a way where you can be at ease and you can be relaxed. And this is what this word arama seems to mean. Anyway, I find that really fascinating, and I, I apologize if it, if it may not mean that. That much to Sometimes these little things give us a clue about the, uh, the Buddha's teachings and how they are to be practiced and what they actually mean. And um, uh, then the Buddha says that he will give the discourse. Uh, he says here, explanation is a translation here, but the Pali word is more like a, a discourse on the restraint of all the defilements. Yeah, so... Um, so this is on how to basically how to overcome the defilements. Yeah, the other word restraint here is uh, is uh, okay, but in the, in the final sense it means how to overcome all of these all of these defilements of the mind. Yeah. So in other words, you start from the very beginning, you overcome some of the most simple defilements by living in the right way, and then gradually, you go all the way to the end of the path, and you let go of all defilements, bang, free from everything. This is kind of the ideal, this is where we're heading. One 
important point here, this point I every time I teach the suttas, uh, and that is the meaning of the word restraint. Uh, and the word restraint in Pali is uh, sambara. And one of the things that we will look at quite a bit, the meaning of that word really is, uh, what does it mean to restrain? Uh, and I like to make uh, the point to people that uh, this is how you see in the suttas, when you read the suttas quite broadly is a very restrained in English means an application of force. Yeah, you restrain like a child from running into the street. Yeah, in other words, you hold the child back because if it runs into the street, it's going to be hit by a car. So you have to hold the child back. The child doesn't understand it. Yeah. So that's why you have to hold it back. It means an application of force. Restraint in English. But to think that the word restraint is used in the suttas. It's not really an application of force. The way it is used is more an application of wisdom, an application of understanding. Yeah? And um, I have called this entire retreat, the theme is uh, uh, wise reflection. Yeah? And this is exactly what I mean by this, is that when we restrain the defilements, uh, the way to do that is always to reflect wisely to use your mind, to guide it in accordance with the teachings of the Buddha. And as you do that, the restraint happens almost automatically. Yeah. And this is so powerful. Yeah, I, I, I don't know about if you have discovered this in your own life, but to me, it is very, very obvious. Uh, if you always have to restrain by force, uh, if you always have to use willpower to control it in this way or that way, oh, I can't get angry, force, force. Get that angry thought out of my mind where I have to be compassionate. Let me force compassion out of your mind. And if you try to force these feelings, if you try to force to avoid the defilements after mind, after a while, your mind just rebels. Your mind doesn't want anymore. <clears throat> and when your mind rebels, then you lose out. You're not really able to keep that restraint going. It tires you out. It doesn't have any power to it. And so far more powerful and far more useful is actually to use the wisdom now, because the wisdom has the ability to turn your mind entirely around, to look in a different direction. And when you look in a different direction, the defilements disappear just like that. And this is the power of wisdom restraint rather than willpower restraint. And I will talk a lot about this later on, but I want to make the point right now so that you don't misunderstand the idea of restraint. Because in English, restraint has not too much idea of force to it. But what we're dealing with here is really wisdom, it's understanding, it's a sense of, uh, you know, <clears throat> reflecting on what we're doing instead. So the Buddha then says, listen and pay attention. Yeah. This is going to be an important message when the Buddha teaches on his own in this way without being asked. He always says, listen and pay close attention. I will speak. I will speak. So that means that the Buddha is going to talk to us. So what should we reply? We should say, yes, sir. We replied. And then the Buddha said this. So remember that when the Buddha says, listen and pay close attention, he is talking to us. You may think that he is talking to the audience right there in front of you, or in front of the Buddha. Maybe you think that now he's going to talk to the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis in front of him. And of course he is. But remember that the Buddha does not just speak to the people who are there. The Buddha speaks to anyone, whoever is able to read these suttas. When the Buddha spoke these suttas two and a half thousand years ago, he knew that they would be listened to by people for a long, long time in the future. People who live in very different cultures than the culture of India, people in Malaysia, where you are, people in Australia, where I am, or people anywhere, yeah, anyone who is listening to this. Uh, these teachings are so broad and so given in such a general way that they really apply to everyone. So when the Buddha says, listen and pay close attention, he means us. He means you. Yeah? So now is your chance to pay close attention. Now is your chance to give ear and to try to take on board these teachings. The Buddha is speaking to each one of us. Yeah, make these things real. 
Don't make these things theoretical. Make it as if the Buddha is actually right here now giving us these teachings. So, and when you think in that way, it is far, far more powerful than just reading them as if they are some kind of ancient teaching here, which may not, may or may not apply to us quite in the same way. Here. Remember, the Buddha really is talking to us. So this is really the issue here. here. So what does he say? So let's see what he has to say. Mendicants, I say that the ending of the defilements is for one who knows and sees, not for one who does not know and see. For one who knows and sees what? Proper attention and improper attention. When you pay improper attention, defilements arise. And once they grow, when you pay proper attention, defilements don't arise, and those that have already arisen are given up. So, um, this is already very interesting. Yeah? And uh, there's a lot of information in this tiny little passage. Uh, yeah? Uh, the first one here, the Buddha starts by saying that the ending of the defilement, in other words, the ending of the asavas, uh, is for one who knows and sees. Uh, yeah? Knowing and seeing, these are two very important words in the Pali language. These are jnana and dasa, and you find that all the way throughout the suttas. Uh, for example, we have the very important phrase, yata buddha jnana uh, see, knowing and seeing in accordance with reality. Uh, and this is what you need to be able to become an area. You have to see this according to reality. Yeah? And this is what it's after samadhi. You see this throughout the suttas. Knowing and seeing according to reality happens after samadhi practice. Uh, yeah? So when the Buddha says that the ending of defilements is for one who knows and sees, uh, what it means, knowing and seeing, usually refers to stream entry. Yeah, when you first become an Arya. So the thing is that first you have to know and see. First, in other words, first you have to become a stream enterer. And based on that, then you can end the defilements completely, which is which is the idea of arahantship, how to become an arahant. So the Buddha said this is twofold. Yeah? First of all, you become a stream enterer, then you become an arahant. And perhaps you think, well, what, how does that relate to me? Because we think that this is very nice in one way, but it may be also very far away. So how does it relate to each one of us? Uh, and uh, uh, it is important here to understand that even though the main meaning is the idea that knowing and seeing refers to stream, Always remember that all of these it comes in a large number of different degrees. Uh, yeah, knowing and seeing it starts out with a very basic knowing and seeing, and the initial knowing and seeing is just understanding the word of the Buddha, understanding what the Buddha is uh, talking about. Uh, yeah, and that knowledge is really the starting point. Uh, and the more you apply that knowledge in your own life. Uh, the more you start to turn your mind in the direction of which the Buddha turned his mind, the more you are seeing things from the internal point of view in the same way that the Buddha saw things. One of the important things of the Buddha's teaching is to internalize these teachings. Remember, it is not about uh, just understanding things intellectually. The really tricky part of Buddhism is to go from the intellectual understanding of the suttas internalize that those teachings so they actually become a, a part of you your outlook has changed that is what matters so when you hear the buddha talking about the dangers of sensual pleasures yeah when you go out into the world and you realize the impermanence of the phenomena around you when covid arises and you think yeah i did that when you really think i expected that when you don't get worried about it or concerned about it, or you think, oh no, what's happening to the world? Then you have internalized the teachings, because now you are seeing the world in the same way that the Buddha saw the world. You have to internalize that in that way. Yeah? When you hear someone dying, when you hear someone get sick, when you hear something happening to some of your possessions or whatever it might be, when something goes wrong in your life, or also when they go right for that matter, 
you should not really be too surprised. And when you're not too surprised, it means that you are beginning on this path of knowing and seeing in accordance with reality. And the point of all of this is that the idea of right view, if you like, right outlook, seeing the world in the right way, is a gradual path. Yeah, we start off by reading the, reading the word of the Buddha, we gradually internalize the view of the Buddha, and we have to come back to that right view of the Buddha again and again and again. And as we do that, we internalize it more and more and more. Yeah, this is kind of what this is about. And as you internalize more and more, uh, uh, then you are acquiring that word of the Buddha, you are acquiring that right view in a very same way. So knowing and seeing, uh, which we have lost the knowing and seeing, it has gone a bit too high. Can we go a little bit back, back please, on the screen? So uh, we have a little bit higher still? Yeah, that's good, that's good. So knowing and seeing is also a gradual thing, and very important to remember that. And then as we develop knowing and seeing, we are approximating to the way that the Buddha understood the world. And then we enables, enables us to practice the path even more powerfully, stage by stage, gradually, gradually moving towards these profound insights and the beautiful teachings of the Buddha. So that is the very first slide there. Yeah, I say the ending of the defilements is for one who knows and sees, and not for one who doesn't know and see. And then, of course, the question is one who knows and sees what exactly? And um, this is also very interesting um, because uh, this sutta gives a very an unusual way of thinking about knowing and seeing. Uh, and uh, that, so that is going to be what happens after lunch, yeah, coming back at 12.30. Uh, I have to uh, run off now, otherwise Ajahn Brahm will tell me off and he will, he will say I'm a bad monk. I have to uh, get rid of those defilements of being a bad monk. So I have now head off to the, uh, to the lunch. So please everyone have a nice lunch for yourself uh, and uh, I will be back here again at 12.30 in the roughly two hours time now. Thank you, Archan. Can we all give three bows to Archan?